Have you ever had the feeling that you knew what someone was going to say just before he said it? Or have you ever walked into a strange room and had the sensation that you'd been there before? Well, if you have, you've taken a small step beyond. Now watch a giant step. We're about to go beyond the gay, grinning face of the circus into the very private world of the flying Petruzios, aerialists unsurpassed. One night, about five years ago, on the high trapeze, something happened. It was a performance for which no tickets were ever sold. But one man saw it. All right, that's okay. Now, let me see your wrists, Mario. I can do it myself. You like her, she them. Why don't you stop treating me like I was six years old? Please, stop worrying. Hey, hey, it's Papa I worry about, you know? Those wrists, they gotta catch him. Oh. <laughs> His wrists are okay. The rest of him, not so okay. Lay off. Oh, come on. You two fighting again, Finitela. If Papa would just mind his own business. I give him a father's advice. He doesn't listen. That's his funeral. Yeah, Carlotta, that, that fancy wife of his. Oh, I'm happy you didn't forget we got a show to do today. Paula. See Carlotta anywhere? Yeah, right outside. She's yakking with that red headed fellow. You know, the guy who takes care of the animal. Hey, Carlotta! Come, we've got to get ready. So I'm ready. In old country, women don't talk to every bum that passes in town. Old country, old country, old country! Take a look at the map. This is the USA. So, in the USA, they got no regard for honor, eh? No, no respect for family uh, name. Family name. But that don't mean nothing, hey, eh? Papa. Uh, please, please, eat, eat your chocolates. The amazing Petruccios are at it again. What were you doing out there? Check with the FBI. Carlotta. How many times do I have to tell you I don't hand out timetables? No scherzare. Could be I married the wrong Petruzio. She does not mean anything. She just like, got a crazy sense of humor, you know. Nice crowd out front. No one sitting on their hands. I'm not gonna stand for this no more. No more making eyes to every man that passes. No more telling her your own bra. Papa, she was kidding. A peace. Everybody's a laughing behind our backs. Everybody's saying, a poor Mario. She's gonna be a good wife, or out she goes. Don't tell me out she goes, she's my wife. You do like I tell you. And don't count on it. The blood is dry by the time I have to catch you. Mario! Brutta Villara, vergognati! Papa, he does not mean that. No, he doesn't mean it. He, he lost his temper, that's all. Like you, Gino. Come on, come on, vieni, preparati. Come on, don't think about it. Come on.
gentlemen, I must ask for complete silence as the flying Petruzios attempt their death-defying feat, which has made them the toast of seven continents. You will notice they are removing the safety net from the center ring. And now may I call your attention to the platform 80 feet above where Senior Gino Petruzio is about ready for his plunge into space. Across the ring, his son, Mario, will attempt to catch him. Again, I ask for silence. They are about ready, so I must implore every one of you to remain absolutely silent. Papa, Mario didn't mean that. Well, he's going to live. Oh, si hanno dato il Dio. Dio, ti grazie. Oh, thank you, Dante, not thank yet. you. Not yet, don't thank me yet. He's paralyzed. Come. Every nerve, every muscle in his body. He can't talk, he can't turn his head. Oh. How long he will be like that? I don't know. A man like Bob. Strong like a boy of 20. He's awake now. You can oh see him Dio. for a few moments. Dio. Oh, mio Dio, come faremo? Ma perché ah, questa mamma, disgrazia? Mamma. <laughs> oh, Vergine Santa, dammi tu una forza. <sighs> All right. We, we go, eh? We go see Papa. Mario. You are the oldest son. You, you go in first, eh? Come on. No, Mama, I... Come on. Mama, he thinks I dropped him. Papa, don't think nothing. You go in first. Avanti. But Mama... Go in! I was sure a dumb thing to do, running off like that. I couldn't help it. How does he look? Well, if you ask me, it would have been better if he'd have died. Don't talk like that. I saw him. You didn't. He's like a mummy or something. Hey, shut up. I tell you, it gives you the creeps just looking at him. I said shut up. Look, Buster. It's been a pretty tough night for all of us. But just don't get smart with me, because I won't put up with it. You're not that big a bargain. Remember that. Carlotta, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't go in to look at him. I knew what I would see in his eyes. Carlotta, I didn't drop him. Well, who said you did? His eyes would say I did. Thank you. 
か。Welcome home. I was just picking up a few things. I asked Carlotta, but she was busy. I went to visit your dad the other day. Did your ma tell you? You know, no one ever accused C.C. Higgins of being a betting man. But I've got a twenty-dollar bill that says Senor Gino Petruzio is going to be back up on that trapeze within a year. Every time I call the hospital, it's always no change. Oh, don't give me that no change. I saw that old Latin sparkle in his eyes. What's the hurry? Uh, got lots of things to take care of. Oh, come on, Mario. Give me a break. I'm not trying to push you, but when are you coming back to work? Sorry, Mr. Higgins. No more of that for me. It's been three weeks. Every Thursday, there's been a paycheck, just like you were still bringing in the customers. Mr. Higgins, I appreciate... How long can that go on? Fair's fair, boy. Now, a week from Wednesday, we are moving on to Chicago. I want you and Paul and Collada to be with us. I wouldn't go back on the trapeze if you gave me the whole circus and let me wear a parachute. Do you know what those doctor's bills are going to be like? Don't worry. They'll be paid. Walk out on me and I won't pay them! Mr. Petruzio? Sit down, sit down. You didn't answer half the questions, Mr. Petruzio. They're stupid questions. They made me nervous. These job classification tests are very important. They're an attempt to approach employment on a scientific basis. Scientific? A sees an airplane flying overhead in a northerly direction. What are you going to get me? A, a job watching airplanes? The idea is to measure intelligence. You advertise, you get people jobs if they pay. Okay, I got money to pay. I don't want a bunch of stupid tests. I want a job. Have you done any other kind of work? I mean, besides the circus. I told you. I've been working on a trapeze since I was 11 years old. You haven't even answered the questions about education. Once my mama, she paid a bookkeeper with the circus to teach my brother and me how to read and write. Frankly, I don't know what to suggest. I mean, it's almost impossible without previous experience of some sort. Uh, there might be work as a laborer. Laborer? Well, the pay is very good, sometimes as high as $3 an hour. Hey, mister, I made 400 bucks a week last year. I gotta pay you to get me a job for three bucks an hour? Perhaps you should go back. Hey, I didn't come here for no tests. And I don't come here for no advice. Maybe you... Uh, I don't know what I thought. I just feel rot! Would you send up a bellboy, please? I almost visited Papa today. I sure came close. <laughs> Look what I bought. Him. Italian cigars. Boy, they're like sticks of dynamite. Does he love them? And how's he supposed to smoke them? It's just the idea of the thing. You know, like a peace offering. Like I was thinking about him. Sit me up. 
I bought the cigars. And I went down to 6th Street to catch the bus that goes to the hospital. And I would tell the nurse who I was. I'm Mario Petruccio, the oldest son. And I've come to spend an hour with my father. And I would walk right down the hall, no thinking about anything. Right in the room, 612, and I would pull up a chair. And I'd say, hey, Papa. Papa, I bought you some of these lousy cigars so you could stick up the whole place. That's not what I would say. I would drop to my knees and I would say, Papa. Say you know I didn't let you fall. Say you know so I can live. But I couldn't. I couldn't face him. Come on in. Right there. Where, where are we going? I'm going. But you can't. <laughs> Watch me. You can't. Listen, Buster. It wasn't exactly a bed of roses, even when you were one of the magnificent Petruccios. Go home to Mama, Mario. She'll make you a thick minestrone soup, and everything will be just fine. Papa was right about you. Papa said you were no good. <laughs> Papa was right. No good. It's no good. The hotel say you'd probably be here. Hey, Pete, another. Mama sent me. Tell her I'm okay. She didn't send me to see if you are okay. We need some more money. Here. Tell her to buy herself 10 pounds fancy chocolates, compliments of her oldest son. That's all you have? That's it. That's the whole bankroll. So what are we supposed to do? Look, I sent you 100 bucks last week. That was two weeks ago. What do you want? Blood? I tried to get a job. Me too, I tried. And the mailman still keeps coming around, still with around the clock nurses. You should see the bill we got from the specialist who flew out here last month. Done him a lot of good, huh? He's a lie. Hey, Paul. What do you want me to do? Ask me something hard. Call Mr. Rigg in Chicago and tell him we are coming back. No. You tell me how we get money. Look, I get a pain in my stomach just thinking about the trapeze. Besides, what are you talking about? Look at me. I'm out of condition. I'm stale. The exercise trapeze is still on a practice shelf. It would take me months to get back my timing. Mr. Higgins said we can use it any time we want it. I can't do it. You own it to pass. I owe Papa one thing. One thing.
Okay, Papa. Now it's your turn to drop with me. examining room any minute now. Thank God. You know, it was the strangest thing. I couldn't believe my eyes. He was sound asleep, and then he sort of mumbled something, and then he reached out his arms like that. Oh, pff, but how could that be? His arms are paralyzed. Well, I called the doctors right away, and they took him right up to the neurosurgical room. Excuse me. Must have been your imagination. He can't even move his little finger. Per amor de Dio. Explain it? What we can explain is like a grain of sand in the Sahara of the unexplainable. But we do have a talent for fastening labels onto everything we don't understand. But does that lull us into thinking that by giving something a name, we rob it of its mystery? All right. The word to describe what happened to Gino Petruzio is bilocation. The definition, allowing the body image to show itself and even act at great spatial distances. Now, does that make everything crystal clear? I thought not. But then, wouldn't it be terrifying if everything was known? If there was nothing left for man to discover about his universe, or himself. In a moment, something about next week. For next week, we seriously suggest an adult audience only when we bring you a form of psychic experience never before put on film. It is called The Burning Girl. <laughs>
Sidney's Productions, Incorporated, Silverman and Silverman, Sims, Gerald. 4205. It's the beginning of another business day in the city, 930. But for Mr. Sims, time as we know it is about to stop. In a few moments, he will be hurled back into the dark abyss of the past, where every moment is an eternity. Mr. Sims is about to penetrate the psychic barrier. Now, for this journey, no passport is required, no visa. In Mr. Sims's case, he already has what he needs, a guilty conscience. The high stone hives of the city are alive now with their busy human bees droning into telephones, flicking away at typewriters. But for Gerald Sims, respected vice president of Fidelity Import-Export Company, this day will bring the shock of his life. Paragraph. It is anticipated that we can make delivery at the Port of Marseille on the 1st of July, provided we hear from you by the 20th of this month. The merchandise will be shipped in bond. Yes? I'm sorry, Mr. Sims, but Mr. Dickinson called again asking to see that letter. He says it must go out right away. You can tell Mr. Dickinson? No, don't tell him that. It's almost done. I'll listen to it and then you can have it. I trust this answers all of your questions and the business can be consummated with all possible dispatch. Very sincerely yours. It's all black. Wells? Yes, sir. Come in here, please. Yes, sir? Miss Wells, who's been fooling with my dictaphone? Why, the dictaphone, no one. Is it broken? Who can get in here? Who has a key? I have one, the cleaning woman. <laughs> Perhaps I can fix it. No, 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 don't touch it. Well, maybe a new record. No, never mind. If you would like to dictate no, to later, me, I... Later, Miss Wells. But Mr. Dickinson no, is waiting. No, please, Miss Wells, just leave me alone. Yes, sir. A48, huh? 52 is all right. So long as it's cold. No matter how I try to imagine you in your way, it's much better when I see you.
anything wrong, Fran? No, I, I guess I'm just not very good at living like this. You know, everywhere I go, I imagine that someone's following me. <sighs> That's silly. Even when perfect strangers look at me, I, I think they must know all about us. Jerry, I hate this guilty feeling. Guilty of what? Dancing together a few times, having dinner? Pity we don't have something more to feel guilty about. Anything happened today? Particularly? I mean? Did you hear from Douglas? Mm -hmm. I had a letter from him. It's hot in Guatemala, and the dam is two weeks behind schedule. And he won't be back home until July. That's more like it. Well, now, what little white lie did you tell Janet tonight? <laughs> tonight, you're a very important buyer of farm machinery from Istanbul. You're dark and swarthy. You drink large amounts of some poisonous liquor. Your name's Mr. Ataturk. Ataturk? <laughs> oh, no. That's even worse than it was last week. <laughs> Who was I then? Oh, I... <clears throat> I was Sir Derek Highland Hyde Esquire, uh, going on 78 and terribly interested in sick room supplies, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, this is awful. How oh, awful? To have to act like thieves stealing every minute, every hour. Sitting in dark corners and out of the way places. Wondering how long it will be until what we feel for each other isn't a secret any longer. Jerry isn't getting any easier, either. I know. It's the same for me. There's nothing we can do about it. There's no... way out, is there? Well, if it isn't good old Jerry Sims. Hello, Tom. Well, what a break running into you. Saves me a dime. I was going to call you. Just got into town with some of the boys for oh, the meeting. Yeah. Mrs. Sims, I presume? Uh, didn't know old Jerry had such a good eye. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't stand there, Jerry. Introduce her. Uh, friend, uh, this is Tom Crookshank, an old friend of mine from Chicago. Yeah, an old friend is going to buy us all a great big drink. Oh, no, uh, Tom, thanks. Well, no, we can't. Uh, we have a dinner date. In fact, we're late now. Uh, call me tomorrow, huh? Oh, one for the road. No, no, we really mustn't. Thanks. It's good to see you, though, huh? Give us a rain check. Madame, what can I say? I could have danced all night. The pleasure was entirely mine, Mr. Twinkletoes. You know, I'm going to have about 17 more of these. Hmm. What a hangover you'll have tomorrow. There isn't going to be any. Yeah, you want to bet? I mean, there isn't going to be any tomorrow. Not for us. What brought all that on? Too much brandy? Because that man I hardly know saw us over there? Tell me. I don't know, Jerry. Maybe, maybe all that. Maybe a lot more. I don't know. My father was a very good gambler, you know. And he used to say to me, Honey, play it smart. Quit while you're ahead. That's what I'm going to do. It isn't going to be easy, Jerry. I'm, I'm a little weak where you're concerned. But I'm going to do it, and you're going to have to help me. Help you? By forgetting me, by not calling me. Just erase me. That's impossible. I can't do that, neither can you. Turn love on and off like that. But, Jerry, we're ahead. Let, let's leave it there. 
before anything sordid happens. Like what? Being discovered? Like something even worse, like beginning to hate each other for what we might do to the people that trust us. Or like falling out of love. Jerry, I couldn't stand that. You're not a very good judge of character. I couldn't do that. I'm not a fickle fellow. When I find someone like you, I hold on to them no matter what. Jerry, I love you so much. But I've made up my mind. I want you to give your marriage another chance. And you? I'm going to try. I'm going to try the very best I can. If it doesn't work. Who knows? Well, I know one thing. I love you. And no one's going to take you away. Ever. Well, shall we? Drink and be merry. I can't see. I can't see. It's all black. I want to go home. Take me home, please. Please. Oh, oh my God. Oh. Jerry, what are we going to do? Jerry, do something. Police, let's get the police. No, wait, wait. Look, Jerry. He's dead. There, there, there isn't anything that anybody can do for him. No. Well, why must we ruin our lives? Jerry, my little girl's life. I'll get you home first. You mustn't be mixed up in this. Then I'll go for the police. Do anything. I'll do anything you want now and always. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> his mother. Oh, Jerry, his mother will be waiting for it. His poor mother. <laughs> Oh, Jerry, what's wrong with him? We've got to turn around and go no. back. Whatever happens, I'll face it with you. I was as much to blame as you were. We've got to turn around and go back. Jerry, we've got to. Now, listen to me. Don't you hear me? I heard you the first time. Now, stop it. You're going home. No, so I was wrong, Jerry. I can't. Pull yourself together, friend. Pull yourself together, friend. Now, when you get home, I want you to call the doctor. The doctor can't do it yet. Can you just call him? Tell him you think something's wrong with Jill. Jill? There's anything wrong with Jill? You tell her you think she's running a slight fever, you want to know what to do. Already we're beginning to act like criminals. That's what they call an alibi, isn't it? What if the doctor does decide to come over? I don't think he will. Not this late at night, and not unless you break down on the phone. Now, you do what I tell you. Hello, Janet. Jerry. Did I wake you? Oh. No, I'm all right. I'm at the office. I'm waiting for a call from London. Yeah, the time difference messes everything up. Well, I got rid of him an hour ago. Got the order, too. Oh, uh, Janet, there's the call on the other line. Would you call me back in five minutes, say? No, you call me. Fine. Hello. Hello, Janet. Janet, do you remember that coat you wanted? Which one? I'm afraid it was the mink one. <laughs> you can have it. No, I'm cold sober. You can buy it tomorrow. That phone call was worth waiting for. I got the order. Mm -hmm. I'm 
coming home now. Does that mean anything to you? Good. Me too. I'll see you. These are the faces of guilt, worn by those bewitched by the most implacable, the most terrible enemy of all, conscience. For Gerald Sims and Francis Hiller, it was the longest year of their lives. Now when they meet, they have only one thing to talk about. Jerry, I can't stand it. Just believe me, it's over. It's over. So he thought. Gerald Sims was mighty sure that the year's silence about the death of the boy meant that everything was safely behind them. Over. So he thought. I can't see. I can't see. It's all black. I want to go home. Jerry, what goes with you? Are you all right? Of course I'm all right. What's so tough about that letter? You've written stuff like that hundreds of times. Well, it's important. I want to get it right. Then the thing went on the blink. Well, uh, play the letter back. Maybe I can help. Come on, man. Uh, turn it on. No, no, no. I, I want to do it all again. I'll bring it up to you, ready to go. You look sick. I'm going to give you an assistant. No, no, here. no. It's no good. I want to do the whole thing over. You're acting like a guilty bank teller when an examiner shows up. You need a doctor or something? I've told you I'm all right. Just give me an hour. I promise I'll have it. Well, have it your way. And have it in an hour. Miss Wells? Yes, sir? Get me another record, please, for the dictaphone. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'll put it on for no, you. No, no, no. Just give it to me. I'll do it. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Wells. Dear sir. Dear sir, dear sir, <clears throat> dear sir, I can't see. I can't see. It, it's all black. I want to go home. Take me home. Please. Where? Thank you. Mr. 
Mrs. Hiller, please. Hello. Hello, Fran. Fran, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fran, listen. Something's happened. Somebody knows. I keep hearing a voice on my dictaphone. It's his voice. It sounds exactly the way his voice sounded that night. Jimmy, what's the matter with you? Are you out of your mind? Fran, listen. I've got to see you tonight. You've got to listen to this, too. Maybe... Maybe I am sick. You must hear it, too. Maybe the voice isn't there at all. Please, Fran, tonight. I'll be there. Goodbye. I tell you, he was no ways near me when, for no reason, he goes off the road. I don't know, maybe it was one of those optical illusions. Optical illusion. That's possible. It's possible. A few hours ago, Mrs. Frances Hiller walked into the 23rd Precinct Station and told the police that she couldn't stand it any longer. She referred in a near hysterical state, to a voice heard on this dictaphone. The voice of a young man dead for one year. The police have already listened to this evidence, and this is what they heard. Dear sir. <coughs> Dear sir. Dear sir. Dear sir. That's all they heard despite the tearful claims of Mrs. Hiller. Do you know that conscience is a potent enemy? It has been known to create a voice of its own, a voice of doom, heard usually only by the guilty. However, psychic phenomena offers many reported instances of an apparitional manifestation, wherein the victim has appeared to the guilty long after the event. Now, isn't it possible that, in the case of the guilty, in mind and heart, that they could also receive an auditory manifestation? In this case, a voice from beyond the grave. Isn't it possible? In a moment, a word about next week. Coming on our call presents in the weeks ahead, is a particularly powerful collection of case histories from the world of the occult, which is just one step beyond our understanding, but is nevertheless somewhere out there. You won't want to miss a single one of these exciting episodes.
you ever been certain your telephone would ring in the next 10 seconds? Or have you ever walked down a strange street and had the feeling that you knew what lay beyond the unturned corner? Yes? Then you've had a brief encounter with the world of the unknown. You are ready for the actual human experience that follows. Alcoa presents a new and unusual kind of television program that takes you just beyond the world in which you live. Alcoa presents Aluminum from the world's leading producer, Aluminum Company of America, who creates new and unusual uses of this wondrous metal for the world in which you do live. And now, John Newland takes you one step beyond. Sea is calm now. Guns are silent. Planes in the sky carry nothing more menacing than tourists. All things considered, it's a good time in the world. But it wasn't always so good. Or quiet. Not so very long ago, the sea was a battleground. The sky was filled with death. World War II. It hardly seems real to some of us now. Something consigned to history books. But there were things that happened that never made the history books because they were too incredible to be recorded. That is, except in the memories of the men involved. They remember and will certainly never forget. How many hits did we get? Two, sir. Nothing serious. All right. Secure all battle stations. Secure all battle stations. Secure all battle stations. Well, I hope it's the last we see of them for a while. Sir, all gun crews report secured. What was the foul up on number one gun? Driscoll came unglued, sir. Well, take him below and have Harris tend to him. I did, sir, but Harris is in no condition to treat a sick dog. Again? Yes, sir, again. The engineering officer reports, sir, the electrical board is out. It'll be at least six hours before repairs are completed. All right, boats. All right, sir. Well, this is sure a lucky day. So for six hours, we just sit here. I wonder how long it'll be before one of their reconnaissance planes spots us. Could be quite an afternoon, sir. Could be. What do you suppose made young Driscoll crank up? He'll be all right. I'm not worried about him. Harris? Yes. I think I understand, Harris. Well, I don't, sir. I'd throw you overboard. Wouldn't that be against Navy regulations, sir? Knock it off and stand up. That's going to be a little bit of a problem. Knock it off and stand up! Oh, I've had a belly full of you, Harris. I've had you run up to there. 
with this man in the brig. Aye, aye, sir. Let's go, Harris. All right, gently. Let's go. Come on, brother, gently. Sir? What about Harris? You see him? Yes, I saw him. He was stoned again. I had to put him in the brig. That's the third time in two weeks. May I speak frankly? Since when do you have to ask? I sincerely hope you're going to recommend court martial this time. Harris's behavior is having a detrimental effect on the rest of the men. I know, I know. But you see, Stacy, Harris is trying to... Well, we all have problems. Take over the watch, Mr. Stacy. Aye, sir. Keep your fingers crossed. Six hours sitting here like a fat duck. On your feet, Harris. On your feet! All right, all right. That's all, Boston. Aye, aye, sir. Harris, you're a pretty intelligent fellow. Do you know what being drunk during a battle means? You know what a court-martial would do to you? Yeah, up against a wall. It bang, bang, bang. Harris, you know, you had me pretty confused. I mean, at first. Why would one of the best men in my ship suddenly turn into the Navy's number one fowler? You drink a little, you forget your troubles. What's wrong with that? You ought to try it, Captain. Maybe you could forget how we're stuck out here all by our lonesomes. Who knows, you might even forget the whole lousy war. Has the drink helped you forget your brother? Yeah, I found out about it a couple of days ago. What loudmouth slob? That's none of your business. Everything on this ship is my business, and don't you ever forget it. How old was he? What are we going to have? A nice little heart-to-heart -heart talk? Nineteen. A rich, full life, huh, Captain? I'm sorry. Who isn't? Everybody's sorry. The Navy Department, my mother, the girl who was in love with him. Nobody's as sorry as me. I talked him into enlisting. You want to have a good laugh while we sit out here on the quiet Pacific? This kid brother of mine decided he wasn't going to fight. He and his girl were going to get married and they were going to be medical missionaries. Take penicillin and the word of the Lord to the Hottentots. After Pearl Harbor, I had a nice long talk with little brother. Made him see the error of his ways. You should have heard me, Captain. You would have been real proud. I used every cliché in the book. I didn't miss a one. You have to do God's work with a gun before you can do it with a medicine and a hymn book. I even said that. Well, isn't that about true? Hey, Captain, you're not going to tell me my kid brother died for any noble cause. Come on, he died because a bomb exploded, period. End of report. You really think that's the end of it? I mean, for him. What else is there? You mean like up yonder? Who knows? I know. <laughs> There's nothing. Nothing except what you can see and hear and touch, and you can quote me. This is real. This lousy ship, this stinking brig. You and that little gold braid. That's real. There isn't anything else. There's nothing else. That's also real, Harris. And that's the only reality, God help us. If you have to hate somebody for killing your brother, try hating the enemy.
straight into the wardroom. Be very, very careful with him. But, sir, you know we're under strict orders not to break radio silence. Just do as I tell you. Contact the heavy cruiser Athena and tell them I want to talk to their chief surgeon. Captain Madison speaking. Senior medical officer. Can I help you? This is Lieutenant Commander Stacy. Commander feeling our skipper's badly hurt. He's bleeding to death. We don't know what to do. Fielding? Bill Fielding? Well, isn't there anybody aboard who... We've got nobody. Nobody? There's a foul up in the brig who's supposed to be a pharmacist's mate, and that's all. What's his rating? Before we busted him, he was a pharmacist's mate first class. Send him up to the radio shack. I want to talk to him. Sir, he's hopeless. Mr. Stacy, I'm afraid he's the only hope you have. On your feet, Harris. Welcome to my home away from home, Mr. Stacy. On your feet. You gonna throw me in the ocean like you promised? Move, Harris. shrapnel wound in his neck. We need to know just how serious this is. Now, wait a minute. I'm no doctor. You check it, Harris. Wow. Harris is with me now. Here he is. Tell him what you told me. I examined Commander Fielding. What did you find, Harris? He's got a hunk of shrapnel in his neck. Exactly where? It's on the left side, a couple of inches above the shoulder. How bad's the bleeding? Well, it's pretty bad. Mr. Stacy tells me you're a pharmacist mate first class. I was. At the moment, I'm a prisoner of war. Stop clowning. What do you want him to do, sir? How long will it take to rig a loudspeaker in the wardroom? A couple of minutes. Get some men on that. Good. Now have Harris break out the instruments and start scrubbing. Contact me later. Yes, sir. What's he talking about? What for? Get to the wardroom on the double. What for? Get to the wardroom, Harris! But the way I feel, I couldn't take the nail out of a bedpost. What if I say I just won't do it? What are you going to do, shoot me? You're going to do it. Look, can I get this through your head? Even if I was feeling okay, I couldn't do it. Madison's one of the best surgeons in the fleet. If he thinks it might work, that's good enough for me. Yeah, but the skipper's not a bad guy. This is like killing him. And if we do nothing, what happens then? Here. We're ready, sir. Have you stalled the plasma? Yes, sir. Look, sir, I got the shake so bad, I can't do this. Is he still unconscious? Did you hear what I said? Is he still unconscious? Yes, yes! All right, good. Now, we can't risk using anesthetic in his condition. Sir, will you please listen to me? Now, you listen to me. This is tough, we're stuck, you're going to do it. You're going to follow my instructions quickly and carefully. You're going to do exactly what I tell you to do. Your skipper happens to be a, a very good friend of mine. Okay, let's get on with it. Let's get the thing over with. All right, now. Get some Kelly hemostats from the tray. Yes, sir. Open the sterilizer and get those hemostats and put them in the alcohol.
All right, sir. Now, swab down the wound with antiseptic and drape the area with sterile towels. Okay, sir, that's, that's done. Sir, Dr. Madison? Dr. Madison, are you there? Yes. All right now, Harris. The first step is to clamp off the small veins, tie them with a the suture. You'll see which ones I mean when you begin. If we're lucky, you'll have no difficulty locating them. Put another hemostone in there. Okay, sir. Now you should be able to locate the fragment of shrapnel by gently probing the area. Begin. You better find it. Look, will you wipe my forehead, please? Have you found the fragment? Yeah, I found it. What's the exact position? It's just left of the juggler vein. I'm almost touching it. I was afraid of that. Now listen closely, Harris. That's the critical point. You mustn't, under any circumstances, allow the juggler to be severed. Now, the edges of the shrapnel are undoubtedly jagged. It must be removed with extreme caution. Okay, okay. Now, don't get rattled, Harris. Yeah, that's easy to say. Just take it easy for a couple of seconds. Take a couple of deep breaths. Yeah, take a couple of deep breaths. What's that gonna do, huh? Harris. Okay, let's go. Let's get started. All right. The veins are tied? Yes, they're tied. Very well. Now, grasp the fragment with the hemostat. Gently, firmly. Yeah. I had it. It slipped away. Try again, Harris. Now, try to be just a bit firmer. Once you have the clamp around the fragment. It is jagged, isn't it? It's like a top of a tin can. Are you all right, Harris? Yeah, I got it now. Good. Now, the removal of the fragment is the most delicate part of the job. Now, you've got to let me guide you. One wrong move. What is it? What's that? Oh, no, they broke in contact. Oh, not now! Oh, come on, not now! Well, if we don't get that thing fixed, you'll die. I'll go up the radio shack and try to get through. Don't try anything by yourself, you hear me? Oh, hurry, sir! Hurry! Oh. Oh, come on. Come on, please. What happened? I don't know, sir. The Athena just quit sending. Why? My God, why? It sounded like she was under attack. Maybe they knocked the antenna out. I haven't been able to raise a thing. Contact one of the other ships. Anyone, anyone. Find out what happened. I'll try, sir. Dr. Madison, for God's sake. Come on, please. Harris? Harris? Yes, sir. What happened? We'd lost contact. Is Fielding still all right? 
Yeah, he's still breathing. Well, let's get on with it. Oh, the clamp slipped. Look, I'll have to reach the fragment again. Okay, I got it. All right. Now begin to withdraw the shrapnel. Very slowly. Straight toward you. That's it. No, straight toward you. Carefully. Stop. Oh. I mean, I think he's gaining consciousness. That does not happen, Harris. He can move and lacerate the jugular. Now hold the fragment exactly as it is. Do you understand? Be very calm. It's okay, we're in luck. He's passed out again. Slowly. Firmly pull slightly upward on the fragment. So. Good. Now never take your eyes off the jugular. Up. Now. Straight again. Straight toward you. That's it. I got it. You're not finished yet, Harris. Now. You must tie off the deep bleeders as you did the outer ones. Use the hemostats to clamp them off. Okay. Yes, sir. And what next? Dr. Madison, what kind of bandage do I put on? Harris. What next? Yeah. I told you not to go on without Madison. I didn't. What do you mean you didn't? He guided me every step of the way. I couldn't have done it without him. We contacted the Dayton. The Athena received two direct hits. One bomb caught the radio room. Killed everybody instantly. Everybody. What? It's impossible. I couldn't have done this without him. He guided me every step of the way. Harris, are you out of your mind? There couldn't have been a sound out of that loudspeaker. Dr. Madison was killed ten minutes ago. Lieutenant Commander Stacy was right about one thing. The heavy cruiser USS Athena did take two direct bomb hits from enemy aircraft at 1040 hours. March the 22nd, 1944. One of the bombs knocked out the communication system of the ship, at the same time killing radio man first class Tom McCrory and Captain Clyde Madison, the senior medical officer aboard the USS Athena. I suppose, too, that we reasonable people must agree with Lieutenant Commander Stacy on another count. After Madison was killed, the further transmission of his voice was absolutely impossible. But it was also absolutely impossible for pharmacist mate Harris, an untrained man, to complete this final and most complicated stage of the operation without his voice. To really explain what happened in that hot, steamy wardroom, we cannot look simply to logic or reason, can we? I can only tell you that there is now, living in Southern California, a retired naval officer who has a word for it. His word is miracle. His name is Will Fielding. In a moment, something about next week. Kill. Can it kill nine times in nine consecutive generations? Seems incredible, doesn't it? Well, next week, we will bring you one of England's most celebrated outbreaks of witchcraft. We hope you'll be in the audience.
The amazing drama you're about to see is a matter of human record. You may believe it or not, but the real people who lived this story, they believe it, they know. They took that one step beyond. It begins here, in the Elite Bar and Grill, with a wedding party. There's not one thing that sets Sally and Matt Conroy apart from all the other couples who were married today in the United States. Not a thing. Not yet. <laughs> Baby. How about that Georgie boy, eh, Matt? He hasn't had that much exercise since he dumped that load of grapefruit up on the ridge road. <laughs> hey, looks like that little gal of yours could keep on dancing all night, Matt. Uh, not if I have anything to say about it. <laughs> Sorry, baby. When I get going, I get carried away. Hey, why don't you take it easy, you big lug? <laughs> you all right, Sal? Oh, I think so. Let's try it again. I was just getting warmed up. Hey, back in the stag line, Georgie. Boy, you've had it. My turn to dance with the bride. Oh, I'd just love to dance with all you gentlemen again. Huh? Yeah, but they won't hold our room after nine if, well, if we don't get there. Oh, that'd be a shame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, we want to thank you for the party, fellas. Just watch one last round for the road on me. Hey, Tommy, say, how'd Conroy ever find you down among those bayous, honey? Well... He transported my cousin's belongings when she moved back home a couple months ago. And, well, one thing led to another. Here I am. How do you like it? Oh, I love it. I've never been northeast or west of Louisiana before in my entire life. Well, no one would know it in the way you talk, honey child. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Sal, let's get going. Well, thanks again for the party, fellas. Say, Matt, don't we get a chance to kiss the bride? Yeah! <laughs> What were you dreaming about? I don't know. Why? Well, you were making all sorts of funny faces, funny noises. Did I look awful? You couldn't look awful if you tried. Of course, you look a lot better when you're smiling. How much further is it? Why? Are you going to be so tired from all this driving? I mean, I sure wish I knew how to drive so I could help you. Just gonna have to learn, that's all. Nutty for somebody to live in California and not know how to drive a car. What's the matter? Huh? What's the matter? I don't know, nothing. Those crazy guys down at Tommy's, you sure knocked them for a loop. I guess you know that. Of course, you kind of knocked me for a loop, too. I tell you, I'm sure glad your cousin decided to go back to Louisiana and call NorCal Van and Storage. Matt, if we turn left about a mile ahead, it's a prettier drive. How'd you know that? It's beautiful and wild and secluded. There's a hill straight ahead, just past those pines. Go up the hill. How in the world did never you Never mind, not... never mind. That's it. Eagle Point's just ahead. Eagle Point? Turn right. Be careful. There's a fallen tree across the road.
Sally. Sally, what's the matter with you? Sally, what in the world's the matter with you? Who are you? Oh, come on, Sally, stop kidding. Will you please take your hands off me? Sally? Sally! I don't know, her voice sounded so different, she looked so different. I don't know. Well, there aren't many roads through here. Shouldn't take us long to find her. How would she know about a place like this? She's never been up here before in her life, I'm sure of it. Why would she kid me about driving a car? She looks so different. Now that's mighty strange. What are the lights doing on in the Warden place? Is that your car? Yeah. I wonder what Sally's doing here. Beats me, mister. Who lives here? Nobody now. Well, how come the electricity's still on? The state hasn't been settled yet. The girl who used to live here jumped from a place called Eagle Point a couple of weeks ago. Eagle Point? Kind of gives me the creeps, a nice girl like that committing suicide. What a mess. Had to make identification from dental records and stuff like that. No! No! No. What are you trying to do, scare me to death? I didn't. You know what I ought to do, I you silly dame? I ought to belt you one. I didn't kill myself. Sally! I didn't, Sally! I didn't, Jeff. I was Sally. murdered! I was murdered! I was murdered! I was Sally. murdered! Sally. Uh. Sally. How much longer is this going to go on? Is what going to go on, Mr. Conroy? Every time she wakes up, it's another sedative, another shot. Is that the only thing you can do for her, keep her asleep? Yes, Mr. Conroy. It's been 24 hours. Look, I could feed her sleeping pills myself. Mr. Conroy, your wife was quite violent when you brought her in here, quite incoherent. Every time she wakes up, she tries to run away. Now, how would you suggest that we restrain her? Would you prefer a straitjacket? You haven't even told me what's wrong with her. Well, what's wrong with her? I don't know. Well, when will you know? Do you see that library? Every mental and emotional disturbance known to medicine is described somewhere in these books. Your wife's case is not among them. 
Well, then I'll just have to go to some other hospital where there'll be somebody who can help her. That's your privilege, Mr. Conroy. I don't think it will solve anything. I'm going to be quite frank with you. That young woman you brought in here is not That young to be... woman? What do you mean, that young woman? She's my wife. She's not your some... wife. Does this sound like your wife? Alex, I've told you there's no time. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you keeping me here? To try to make you well, Mrs. Conroy. Why do you keep calling me that? Because that's your name. My name is Karen. You know that. Alex, please, why won't you help me? I'm trying to help you, Mrs. Conroy. There is no Karen Horton. Karen Horton is dead. Karen Horton committed suicide. No! No! I was murdered! You must believe me! I was please. murdered! I was murdered! Alex, please, Alex! There isn't any Quick time! Nurse. Why won't you help me? Quick please, nurse. please, please! Alex, Alex, listen to me. Listen to me. I'll be calm. I promise. Please, Alex, I'll be calm. I'll be calm. My name is Karen Wharton. I was born in Fort Washiki, Wyoming, on February 10th, 1935. My mother's name is Mary Louise. My father, Philip Joseph Wharton, died of pneumonia on April 12th, 1939. Your wife, Ellen, drowned at the 4th of July picnic in 1941 at Lake Etna. And four years ago, at the Harvest Moon Ball at the Country Club, you asked me to marry you, Alex. Never mind, nurse. Who murdered you? Dan Stapler. Dan Stapler? Why? Because I wouldn't give him a divorce. Dan Stapler isn't married. We were married secretly last year in Mexicali. Why secretly? You know why. Mother hated him. And she was right. His passion cooled considerably when he found out that none of Daddy's money was in my name. Then why didn't you give him a divorce? Because I loved him. I would have been anything he wanted me to be if he'd only loved me. I can't tell you how mortifying it was. How revolted I was when I saw him at the beach with other women. And at parties. I loathed him and I loathed myself because later, when he'd come to me, Touch me. Regarding your inquiry, Daniel Stapler married to Karen Horton, this city, June the 11th, 1956. Mexicali Hall of Records. Well, can't there be some sort of explanation? Maybe she read about the death in a newspaper. Well, couldn't it just be a coincidence? Well, what is it? Some sort of psychic hocus-pocus or something? Is that what you're trying to tell me? You'd hardly expect a psychiatrist to tell you a thing like that. Why did he murder you? Because he found somebody who did have money. That night. That night. Go on. It had been weeks since I'd seen him. He dropped by that night without any notice at all. And the famous stapler charm was in full bloom again. And of course, I fell for it again. Dan always had a divine sense of timing. He told me his real reason for the visit, that he wanted a divorce. While he was making love to me, I told him I'd never divorce him, not ever. And then he behaved like a six-year-old child having a temper tantrum. He cried out that I cheated him, ruined his life. He stomped his feet and his voice screeched like a petulant woman. He looked so ridiculous. He suddenly looked so ridiculous that I started to laugh. I suppose it was hysteria more than anything else, but I couldn't stop. He turned very white and came at me. He struck me with his fist. And before I could tell him that, yes, 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 you can have your divorce, he killed me. 
How? It wasn't a pleasant death, Alex. I didn't die quickly. Finally, he crushed my skull with, with something heavy. And then he took my body to Eagle Point and flung it off the edge to make it appear a suicide. Alex, do you believe me? How can I, Mrs. Conroy? But you must! I'm not Mrs. Conroy! He murdered me! I can prove it! I can prove it! Alex, listen to me! I can prove it! I can make you... Let me go! I can make you believe me! Let me go! Listen to me, Alex! No! 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 What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Yes? We'll be right up. Your wife's awake. Dr. Slauson, let me go in first. Honey, are you feeling better? Alex, I want to call my mother. Your mother in Louisiana? Alex, please, don't start that again. Please let me call my mother. Why? Because she'll believe me. Will she? Yes. I think perhaps I'd better call her, don't you? It's going to be an awful shock. Tell her I want to see her. It's all right if I get dressed, isn't it? I don't want her to see me like this. I must look terrible. Yes. Get dressed. You know, Sal, we, uh, we promised your cousin Diana we were going to wire her right after the ceremony. Only in all the confusion down at Tommy's. Would you mind leaving so I can get dressed? Did you call her mother? I mean, Mrs. Wharton. No. No, I didn't. Mr. Conroy, I'm going to try something drastic. You gave me this a long time ago, remember? Of course I remember, Alex. been much change in five years? Five years is a long time. Did you call my mother? Not yet. In case you've forgotten, the number is 5211. I remember. Will you call her now? Why don't you rest for a while? I'll take care of it. Miss Peterson. Mother, please help me. Tell them who I am. 
tell them who I am. Who are you? Who are you and why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? Mommy! Mommy! Mommy, please! Here, take these. When she put her arms around me, it was Karen. I know it was. And it was Karen's voice. Oh. But she is dead, Doctor, isn't she? Yes, Karen is dead, Mrs. Wharton. Doctor, Mrs. Conroy's gone. Something heavy. With something heavy. now we start with this the police dan stapler oh i mean about her i don't know about her mm. hi don matt is something wrong Not now. Now, we got lost for a while, but we're all right now. We're going to be married a long time, Mrs. Conroy, and it, it, it's going to take me a long time to... Oh, thanks. Nice technical word, but what happened to Sally Conroy? It's called possession. That is, the dead temporarily taking over the body of the living. Terrifying? It terrified Dan Stapler into a quick and full confession. There are thousands of cases of possession in the records, many of them fully authenticated by respected scientists. We've seen one. To whom it happened, we know. Where it happened, we know. How or why it happened. Good night. Whether or not you believe that coming events cast their shadows before them, be with us next week when five different people, totally unknown to each other, see the hideous shadow of a great disaster weeks, days, hours before it happens. This heretofore untold drama comes from the testimony of those who took that one step beyond.
Have you ever been certain your telephone would ring in the next 10 seconds? Or have you ever walked down a strange street and had the feeling that you knew what lay beyond the unturned corner? Yes? Then you've had a brief encounter with the world of the unknown. You are ready for the actual human experience that follows. Last year, American fire insurance companies paid out a good many thousands of dollars for damages resulting from fires that they found, well, difficult to explain. Fires for which there seemed just no earthly reason. No earthly reason. There was such a fire in 1921. Some boys came in after high school, like they always do. They were buying sarsaparilla and stuff. Then uh, Patty Leland came in with a new kid. Never saw her before. She hung back when she seen the boys, but Patty made her come in. Then the boys started teasing the new girl, laughing about something, and she got real upset, almost cried. I was going to tell them to stop teasing the girl, but before I could, I had other things in my mind. A flame shot up from the floor right by a barrel of excelsior. Ah, some kid threw a match into it. No, sir. It didn't start in the excelsior. And nobody threw a match. A fire doesn't start from nothing. Well, this one did. Hey, you! Tim Plunkett! Come in! Come in! Tell Chief Keating what happened. Just like you said. I went... <laughs> It's like one of them um, Roman candles or something. <laughs> Setting a fire is no laughing matter. Unless you did it. I wasn't any place near that barrel. Well, the only ones near that, that barrel were uh, Patty and Alice. Come to think of it, that's right. But Patty wouldn't do such a thing. Why, I've known her since... What's the name of the new girl? Alice Denny. Where does she live? On the corner, across the street from uh, Burgers Woods. Who else was in the store? Uh, Pete Hubbard, Billy Wolf. But they're all right. I've known them since. It doesn't they... make any difference how long you've known them. What's so funny? Nothing. I'm going to let you go. But that doesn't say I won't check up on you. Now beat it. Why don't you leave her alone? What's the matter, Alice? Mm, nothing. Come on, tell me. Hey, you saw I didn't do anything, didn't you? You saw it wasn't my fault. Your fault about what? The fire. Well, of course it wasn't your fault. Who said it was? Nobody. Oh, just let them try and blame you. You don't have to be nice to me. Why are you so touchy about things? Like today in class, for instance. You shouldn't let Tim Pluckett make you mad. Oh. oh. I wish he didn't sit behind me. I can feel his eyes on me all the time, just staring at me. And I, when I have to get up to be called, and I, I can't think straight. Well, everybody forgets sometimes when they have to stand up and recite. He's the one that started laughing, you know. And he made everybody else start laughing. They laughed and laughed and... 
You shouldn't have run out of the room. He's always teasing me. Right from the very first day. Now the kids always laugh at me. They only laugh because they feel sorry for him. Why? Because he's going on 18 and still with us freshmen. Girls don't even like to date him because he's so clumsy and stupid. Maybe that's why he teases you. He wants you to notice him. It's getting late. My pa doesn't like me out after dark. Well, you can cut across by the shack. It'll save time. No. Oh, come on. I'll go with you. Oh, no, no, please. I, I, oh, I come on. No, you get way up on the hill. No. Is that old place what scares you? It's been vacant for years. Come on, I'll show you. No! What's wrong? Do you have any brothers or sisters? No. Just you and your mom and dad, huh? Oh, my ma died. My aunt keeps house for us. It's nice of you to walk me home. I wanted to. I want to be friends with you. Best friends. Hello, Pa. Alice, you're late. I'm sorry, Pa. Go up and get ready for supper. Pa, I've got a friend, a best friend. Good, who is it? Her name's Patty Leland. Well, it might interest you to know that I'm working for Mr. Leland. Started today. You did? Hmm? Putting new shingles on their barn roof. If he likes my work, he may keep me on. He owns a lot of property. I'm glad. Go <laughs> on upstairs. Alice. You remember how proud your ma was of you. You won't spoil things this time, will you? Will you? No, I won't, Pa. I won't. Supper's ready. It's been ready. Going to eat with your coat on? Hope it isn't spoiled. How's school, dear? Fine, Aunt Mildred. Well, now, this looks mighty good. I'll get it. Yeah, there was quite a fire at Purdy's this afternoon. Everybody downtown was talking about it. They say it just, just flared up for, for no logical reason. I wasn't there. Didn't say you were, dear. It's human nature, though, for kids to watch a fire. I can see why you wouldn't want to, though. Considering all that's gone before. Don't talk like that. You wouldn't dare talk like that if Pa was here. Now, I don't think you ought to use that threatening tone. Not after what I've done for you. I haven't told you, Pa, what happened in the woods with that boy. I told you nothing happened. He was hiding in that shack. He came chasing after me. I came home all dirty because I fell down. I don't know. I think I'd better tell you, Pa. Why do you have to make everything seem so awful? Why do you have to make me sound so rotten? I told you not to use that tone. I'm gonna tell you, Pa. Please don't tell my Pa. You'll say all the wrong things and you'll make me seem so bad. I don't know why I should go on being nice to you when you're planning to give me trouble with your pa. I won't. I promise I won't. Alice, when you came in that front door, you knew you'd done it again. What? That was the fire chief. 
He's making a check on all the kids who were in Purdy's store when the fire started. Well, I didn't tell him anything about what had happened before, so you're in the clear once more. Alice, I give you my... I didn't do it, Pa. I swear I didn't do it. Stop lying. You threw that match. I didn't even have a match. Then how did you start it? I don't know how it started. It's like always, just before it happens, everything goes dark. I don't know! You do know. You start them. Now, you listen to me. I've had to move to three different towns in the past four years on account of you. Your Aunt Mildred and I have tried to stand by you. And all you've given us is headache and disgrace. Well, I've had enough. Now, Willie, Willie, why don't you Mildred, sit down? Mildred, you protected her long enough. Alice, you're old enough to know the difference between right and wrong. You listen to me. If you cause me to lose one more job, if you cause me any trouble at all, you're going to get yourself out of it. Do you understand me, Alice? I didn't do it, Pa. Do you understand me? I didn't do it, Pa. Alice, you've got to stop saying that. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Did you I wait a minute. Just... Wait a minute. Want all the neighbors to hear? Isn't it shameful enough? I was glad your mother isn't here to see this. wear beads. I've had my class to a Halloween party ever since I can remember. I just love Halloween, don't you? Yeah, I love Halloween, too, but I've never been to a party. You haven't? <clears throat> wow, I sure am glad Tim Pluckett's moved away so I don't have to invite him. So am I. He's a big oaf, that's what he is, scaring the way he did in the woods that time. I'm not even scared of the woods anymore now that he's gone. <clears throat> oh, da -da -da -da. It's so naked. <laughs> well, don't you look nice? Thank you, Mrs. Leland. She thinks people say it's too naked. Nonsense. Evil to him who evil thinketh. Oh, this costume does bring back memories. All four of my married daughters wore it at some time or another. Here, you two, you better take it back to the attic. Party begins at 8 sharp, and you've got to eat your dinner yet. Alice can't eat with us. Why not? My Aunt Mildred wouldn't want me to. Oh, well. Here, wait a minute. No self-respecting gypsy will ever wear braids. Come on, thank you. Down at the dresser. Here yeah, now. Oh, what lovely thick hair you've got. It's a shame to keep it braided. But my Aunt Mildred likes it braided. Well, do you think that just once she'd mind if... if maybe we put it up like this with a ribbon? Or... down with a ribbon. Oh, that'll look nice. Shall we try it? All Come right. On. All right, let's take the braids out. Always going up there. Spending the night. That shame back here, like, like Miss Know It All. Miss Leland had such pretty hair. <laughs> I guess if anybody in the world knew what I know about that brat, I wouldn't think she was so wonderful. I thought Pa'd be back. You know, he had to go to Parterville to do some business for your friend, Mr. Leland. I have to go now. I have to be there by eight. Let me see your costume. Oh, come on, little girl. Take off your coat. Well, 
You ought to be ashamed. Lucky your pa's in here. Mrs. Leland said both her daughters have worn this. Oh? Well, I wouldn't accept such a cast-off rag. But then I don't go chasing people just because they're rich. Oh, that's not the reason Patty's my friend, and you know it. I have to go now. Oh, no, you don't. Not in that. But it's a costume party, and I don't have anything else. Well, then you won't be able to go. You go on upstairs and get out of that and get into something decent. Your father never forgive me if, if I let you go out in that thing. My father? Not my father, it's you. You don't want me to go over to Patty's because I have a happy time and nothing bad happens. And you want it to happen. You do your very best to make it happen. You ungrateful bitch. Look at you. Look at your hair going down your back. You're half naked. You're a Jezebel. That's what you're a Jezebel. Let go of me. You're no good. You're no good. You're chasing after boys. You're just like your ma. That's what you are. You're just like Don't your ma. Don't you dare talk about my ma. Those, those big eyes of hers, those, those tempting ways driving your pa half mad to marry her. Dirty, filthy. You shut your mouth. Just like your ma. Dirty. No good. No good. You come back here. You devil. You witch. I don't know. I don't know what makes us set fires. We've tried so hard to stop. Where's Alice? They told me what happened. Where is she? She's probably hiding someplace until things calm down. Your sister's been telling me the facts about your daughter. And high time. Why did you tell me that she's been setting fires since she was 11? Mildred. I had to, Will. That poor boy with his hands and arms all burned from putting out the fire. If he hadn't, the shack would have burned clear to the ground. The woods would have all burned down. Mildred, what are we going to do? She's going to have to be put away, Mr. Danning. She says she goes blank. Maybe she doesn't know. What do you mean, goes blank? She says that just to make you feel sorry for her. She knows what she's doing. Will. Will, I feel just as bad as you do. But we've got to face it. She's dangerous, and she'll get worse.
and I don't do it on purpose, Aunt Mill. You know I don't. You make it happen. You want it to. Make what happen, Alice? Make what happen? Oh, Aunt Mill, don't. Don't what, Alice? Don't tear up my dress. Don't you dare. What is it, Doctor? She's badly disturbed, badly frightened. About the fire? Something deeper than that. Don't you dare! <laughs> Don't what, Alice? Don't dare what? Ma's not dirty. Don't you dare! Alice! You call Ma dirty? Don't you dare! Miss Denning, will you stand at the foot of the couch so she can see you when she wakes up? Say something to her. Alice. Wake up, dear. Alice. Alice. Go away. Go away. Alice, sweetheart. It's Aunt Mildred. You said bad things about Ma. Go away. Poor child, she doesn't know what you say. You said it on purpose. To upset me. Because that's when it happens. And you want it to happen. Don't talk crazy. I won't live here anymore. It's your home. No, not since my mom left. Not since you came. Shh. Shh. Alice. Alice, baby. Shh. No, don't touch me. Alice. Don't touch me. You made it happen again. You made it happen. It just started. By itself. The fire just started. Not by itself. Because of her. There's a devil in her. She's a witch. I've known it all along. I've known the fire started by themselves. From her. You knew? Why didn't you tell me the truth? From her. From the devil in her. The devil's not in Alice, Miss Denning. You're lying. She's a witch. I saw it. I saw it. We all did. What is it? I don't know. I don't know. Nobody really knows. But Alice was not an isolated case. There have been others. The ability to induce spontaneous combustion may be a survival of a power from ancient times then it would have been called a miracle of great value. For the worship of fire stems from man's earliest beginnings. Well, at least that's a theory. I can tell you some facts about Alice herself, however. Today she is happily married with grown children of her own. And her power, a power she certainly never wanted, disappeared when she felt secure, when she knew she was loved. In a moment, a program note about next week. Of all the souvenirs of World War II, this wrench is perhaps the weirdest. In fact, it's the star of next week's journey into the world of the unknown. Supported by a submarine crew who waited for death at 40 fathoms. The amazing drama you're about to see
is a matter of human record. You may believe it or not, but the real people who lived this story, they believe it. They know. They took that one step beyond. <laughs> Inconspicuous, but smart, and right off the park. Few people realize it is the home of the famous stage actress, Elena Stacy. Even fewer know that tonight, after many long, grim months, she's coming home. They've kept that secret. The house is full of tension, secrecy, and something like fear. Because, and let us face it, all of us, Fear the unknown. But more especially do those who seem to hear it calling in a voice from beyond. Did you want something, Mrs. Marple? No, sir. No, unless... Oh, Mr. Stacy, if you've changed your mind, I can take care of the room in no time. I can have everything packed away and out of sight before she gets here. Thank you, no, Mrs. Marple. We have to leave that up to her. Mrs. Marple. I'm sorry, sir. Forgive me. I, I'm sure you know best. But I'll go see about the table. I had Mary clean all the good silver and there's some fresh flowers. Now, wait. Mrs. Marple, I thought I'd explained it to you. There's to be no fuss. This is nothing special about tonight. Look, forget the dining room altogether. We'll, we'll have dinner in here by the fire the way we have a million times. You see, it's... It's to be a night like any other night. Just as though nothing had ever happened, you understand? Yes, sir. As if nothing had ever happened. Hi, darling. Hi, sweetheart. Lovely out. Autumn. Mm. Did, you, did you notice? The leaves falling and... Oh, a fire. How nice. I thought you might enjoy having dinner by the fire. Mm, wonderful. Though I'm not too hungry. Are you? Not too. Do you think I... I... I haven't changed, have I? You'll always be beautiful. Well, everyone changes. Ages. I've been thinking of having my hair cut. Uh, uh, oh, Mrs. Marple. Mom. Mom, it's so good to have you home again. 
What are we having for dinner? Oh, a souffle, ma'am, and some nice rare beef that you always used to like. And well, ma'am, it's nothing special. Oh, it's fine, sounds fine. And I, I see, see you've arranged to put us in here. Yes, ma'am. I'll do that, Miss Marple. Yes. <laughs> has held up quite well, hasn't it? Hmm? But perhaps it is a little faded. I hadn't thought it would fade. Maybe, maybe I should get a, a damask in a little darker shape. What do you think that would be a mistake? The world are you talking about? I asked if you thought that the damask should be dark. I'm sure I don't know. Kevin! Couldn't matter less to me what curtains, what what material. This this just won't work. This insane little game we're playing. This what game? I'm sorry. All right, Elena. I said insane game. It's just a phrase, but you know what I meant. But you said your last visit. You promised that the, when I came home, we'd act as though nothing had happened. I was a fool. Your doctor would be the first to agree. Don't you see why it won't work? Because it is an act. Because we're, we're two strangers trying to pretend that nothing has happened. That there's been no tragedy, no loss. There's nothing for us to forget. You've spent many months trying to readjust to a harsh truth. There's no reason why you should accept it alone. I'm your husband. I love you. What hurts you hurts me. The only joy I can contemplate is a, is a joy that I can only contemplate with you. That's the reason why we can have no secrets, no pretenses. It's the reason why it's useless to be talking about curtains and drapes when what's really on our minds is what has happened and how we're going to face up to it from here on in. You're right, Kevin. Excuse me. Oh, that, that's quite all right, Mrs. Marvel, go right ahead. I'm going upstairs. Change. You do that. Hey. Tomorrow, I, I must get Mrs. Marpole to help me put Dee Dee's things away for safekeeping. Yes, darling. I think that would be wise. At least until we need... No. No, Kevin, I I've made up my mind about this. Since I can't have another child of my own, I I'll have none. An adopted child could only remind me of Dee Dee. Oh, I don't want to forget, Dee Dee. 
But I must accept that she's gone. You've come a long way, Elena. I am better. Aren't I? Yes, my darling. Yes. And, and this world of, of unreality I was living in, because I wanted it to be true that, that Dee Dee didn't really die, that, that the truck which struck her down that rainy night was only a nightmare. That delusion won't come back, will it? It, it won't haunt me anymore. No, Elena. No more. Oh, I've missed you so. Oh, darling. I've missed you too. Tonight, we celebrate. I've got the biggest bottle of champagne you've ever seen on ice. You're home again. I'll be right back. Hello. Oh, my, how you've grown. Oh, don't be afraid of me anymore. I'm all better now. I don't hate you anymore. I know it wasn't your fault she ran out into the street. Poor Sam. You've missed her too, haven't you? Yes, I'm just silly. I, I, I thought I heard... I, I'm fine. Of course you are. Of course you are. Yeah. Lass, why know you so your never lip? Some bloody passion shakes your very frame. These are portents. But yet I hope, I hope they do not point on me. And then Othello says, Peace and be still. And then I say, I will so. Oh, Alas, why know you so your nether lip? Some bloody passion shakes your very frame. These are portents. But yet I hope, I hope they do not point on me. Hi, oh, sweetheart. Hi, darling. Mm. Something smells good. What is it? Mm. Get your hot roasted chestnuts right here. Oh, realize. What did I ever do to deserve you? That is a good question. As a matter of fact, lately, very little. Why well, is that nice? What about that sweat I've been knitting? Oh, come on now, Leonard. Knitting. But don't knock it. It's a great pastime. Exactly. Kevin, don't, don't ask me again. I can't do it, really. I can't. Why can't you? You're absolutely brilliant in the part at Stratford. No one's forgotten you yet. That was years ago. Before Dee Dee. You know very well you watch the mare like a hawk, waiting for a good play. Any play? Any play except the play I'm doing. You know very well why I've put off casting. I know why, and it isn't because you, you can't find a, a dozen other actresses better suited. I don't want a dozen other actresses. You'll be marvelous. No, 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 no. S something, something else will, will turn up. 
I couldn't do it to you. Your whole future's wrapped up in this production. I, I can't let your pity for me. Pity? What are you talking about? I need you. Can you honestly trust me? What if... What, what if I, I lost my grip like, like before? What, what if I became ill again and, and let you down? You won't. You won't. You make me feel so sure. Don't think I... I don't understand what, you, what you're doing. You don't need me. I need the chance, like, like therapy. Like the time that, that horse threw me and you made me get back. No, no more talk. You're going to be in rehearsal tomorrow morning. No back talk. <laughs> Where are you going? I'm going to release it to the press. They're waiting on the doorstep. Practically. Hello, Herman. Yes, she's responded to it just beautifully. Yes, she's very excited about it. Yes, she's accepted. Now we can pull all the plugs on publicity. Mm -hmm. Yes, by all means. Mama. Look, first off, I want you to get a hold of Wilson. Leonard Lyons. Mama. Mama. Oh, that's brilliant. Mama, Mama. Yes, of course. Say something Mama, like, uh, Mama, Mama. Elena Mama, Stacy. Mama, don't you hear? Next triumphant return to the stage. Othello. Shakespeare's immortal tragedy. Mama. Mama. Yes, Mama. 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 You can take it from there. You can go on and Mama. just soup it up and give Mama. it a real whiz bang campaign. Mama. Yes, of course. Elena, I don't know what to tell you. It's just too stiff. Now, try it again, please. Why, sweet Othello? Devil. I have not deserved this. Oh, devil, devil. If that the earth could teem with women's tears, each drop she falls would prove a crocodile. Out of my sight! I will not stay to offend you. Kevin? Can I take five minutes? Fine, darling. Goodbye, I think that's the right level. The way we discussed it at lunch, I think it's proof that... Uh, we really got something. Mm -hmm. All right. Dr. Harvey. Ah, Miss Stacy. How do you do? It's so good of you to come to the theater. Oh, well, frankly, Miss Stacy, if you hadn't sounded so so distraught over uh, the telephone. I do appreciate it. Uh, where shall I sit? Oh, this will be fine. Now, this will uh, give us a chance to get a. Uh, Preliminary idea of just how much loss exists. Loss? Mm-hmm. When did you first become aware of a loss of hearing? Well, Doctor, I, I, I don't really have any trouble hearing. But sometimes, people going deaf do hear things that, that aren't there, don't they? I, I mean, I read somewhere, Bells, telephone bells, music, all sorts of weird noises. Yes, that happens. It's called tinnitus. Now, we'll get into your medical history later. Meanwhile, if I can just fit this, like this, so. Comfortable? Comfortable? Uh, fine, thank you. No. What was that? You heard that. Fine. Whenever you hear, raise your hand. I, I didn't hear anything. Doctor, th that, that could mean that... 
that I, I really am... Please, Miss Stacy, don't excite yourself. You didn't hear a tone that time because there was none. I tricked you. Now, once more, please. John Harvey, there. there's nothing to be alarmed about. The young lady simply has a lively imagination. She imagined she might be going deaf. But, as a matter of fact, after preliminary examination, I'd say her hearing is perfectly normal. I'm deaf? Ear doctor? What the devil are you doing with an ear doctor? I'm going to be all right. Till she comes. As truly as to heaven, I do confess the vices of my blood. Her father loved me, oft invited me, still questioned me the story of my life. My noble father, I do perceive here a divided duty. To you, I am bound for life and education. My life and education both to learn me how to respect you. You are the lord of duty. I am hitherto your daughter. But here's my husband. And so much duty as my mother showed to you, preferring you before her father. So much I challenge that I may profess due to the more, my lord. Not only saved Elena Stacy's life, it saved her sanity. For now she knew that the haunting voice was not the echo of a disturbed mind, but an incredible warning. Even more comforting is the thought that possibly one living child was the courier for another child of beloved memory. In any event, the psychic phenomenon we have just seen is called clear audio, which means the hearing rather than the seeing of things that have yet to happen. In a moment, a word about next week's Step Beyond. Next week, and every week, we'll be bringing you the personal records of the rarest kind of human experience, man's adventure in the world of the unknown, that mysterious psychic world beyond our five senses. This is your invitation to take with us that astonishing one step beyond.
Have you ever had the feeling that you knew what someone was going to say just before he said it? Or have you ever walked into a strange room and had the sensation that you'd been there before? Well, if you have, you've taken a small step beyond. Now watch a giant step. The coast of New England, a favorite American vacation land, specializing in codfish, and the legends of witches and their broomsticks, fresh lobster, and haunted houses. Haunted houses? Well, there are many sane and sensible people hereabouts who will swear to you that this house still shelters the unquiet and restless dead. At any rate, if any ghostly inhabitants do dwell within these walls, they certainly had the place to themselves for a very long time. We are told that we're more likely to find evidences of ghostly inhabitants in the upper regions. Well, all old houses creak and groan, don't they? Now, look at this. This is perfectly solid wood and plaster. If there's anything more to it than this, we'll have to look further. The attic is a likely place to begin. No inanimate object can have a personality, we are told. But we forget. For example, we look at a house, we say that it's cheerful, melancholy, gloomy. Now, what we're doing, of course, is simply describing our own reactions. There are some cases, however, which seem to defy this handy explanation. On the New England coast, even today, there are certain houses which can be classified only as unfriendly. Ah, that's more like it. That's what I've been talking about. Well, how do you know it's for rent? Well, let's find out. Come on. Come on. Will you come on? That's a lot. Well, of course it's locked. Oh, isn't that marvelous, huh? I bet that's almost 200 years old. Mandy, let's look someplace else. Look someplace else? Honey, this is it. This is what we've been dreaming about. <laughs> yeah, I can't see a thing. Honey, let's go. Let's go. Let's go in. Mandy, you'll get us arrested. Oh, don't be ridiculous. We really shouldn't be doing Will this. Will you stop? Well, this place really looks lived in, doesn't it? <laughs> now, what is that? Andy, let's go. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Will you look at those columns? Sixty to nineteen oh two. Hey, wake up. Oh, this is really something, isn't it? You like it very much, don't you? I like it, I love it. Don't you? Well, of course. All right, then let's take it, huh?
I hope we're not disturbing your game. Well, you are. Look, we're interested in running a house. Do you handle that sort of thing? Do and I don't. What's that supposed to mean? They do when there's houses to rent and don't when they ain't. Right now, they ain't. What about that uh, two-story job on Cape Ann Road? You mean the Clausen house? You know it? Yeah, I know it. Well, the place is empty. We thought it might be for rent. I wouldn't fool with it. Why not? It's an unfriendly house, ma'am. It don't like people. But it is for rent. Yeah. How much? $500 a month. $500? Listen, uh, I happen to be an architect. Now, I know a little bit about houses. That's a good house, but don't you think that's a little steep? Take it or leave it. Well, you must do a land office business, Mr. Leach. What if we decide to take it? Your concern, not mine. Well, let's talk business then. You don't go to house. What? Don't go to house. Bad. Not a happy place. Yeah, well, we'll make it a happy place. Andy, we've been married six years. I've yeah, never really been alone yet. Now, isn't that why we came here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, it's ours. Boy, I'll get more work done here than I ever did in New York. Hold it. Wait a minute. Don't ruin it. Let's do it right, top to bottom. What's the matter? Nothing. Well, if you want to back out, you can. I haven't signed a lease yet. Oh, don't be silly. It'll be fun cleaning all this up. Give me something to do while you're working on your plans. It's a challenge, all right. And I accept. Hey, I wonder what's in here. from there. Andy, you have no that? right to look. Andy, what's wrong? Don't you feel well? What? I don't know. I feel kind of strange, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's the sea air. Why'd you get so upset about the trunk? I, I was just going to look inside. The what? Honey, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't rent this place after all. Let a place scare you because it's a little dark and spooky, are you? Hmm? There, that's better. I'll go downstairs, see if I can find a lamp. The diary of Elsbeth Clausen, 1899. March 5, 1899. Michael went hunting again today.
August 1st, 1899. Michael spends most of his time these days in the fields, hunting. He shouldn't, it only makes his leg that much worse. And when he returned, he was limping badly. Also, there was blood on his hands. I did not like the way he looked at me. His face was flushed and his eyes burned. He is jealous of Gideon. So many years, his friend. Jill. Nothing. Just an old book. Forget it. Come on. Let's take a look at the rest of the place. shoved a knife right in my leg. Oh, I never felt anything like that in my life. Whew. Like it took my breath away. being very solicitous? I'm worried about you. I'm sure you are. Wait a minute. What is this? It's chicken soup. Looks thick, looks rich. Come here. Come here. Isn't it strange that a man can thrive for years on rum and biscuits and then grow weak and sickly on his wife's cooking? Isn't that strange? Everything you say is strange. I don't know what you're talking about. No, of course not. Aren't you going to eat? It's a different food I need. What do you mean? Nothing. Take it away. I'm not hungry. I wish you wouldn't do that. Do what? Drink the way you've been doing lately. to be together, and we've never been so far apart. Never. You'd like to leave here, wouldn't you? Yes, I would. Why? Because we're not happy here. You're not. That's quite understandable. You miss New York, don't you? 
That isn't it. No, not exactly. You miss something, someone. Andy, I don't follow. Bill, my esteemed partner. What? He kept you from being lonely in New York, didn't he? Why don't you stop pretending? Do you imagine for one moment I didn't know what was going on from the beginning? That's a dreadful thing to say. Hasn't been pleasant for you, has it, being locked up here with me, away from him? I don't know what you mean. You know exactly what I mean, Elspeth. Elspeth? You called me Elspeth. What are you talking about? Oh, Andy, I'm so frightened. I'm so frightened. Let's pack up and get out of here right now. No, we'll stay. Mr. Leach? Yes, ma'am. I'm Ellen Courtney. We rented a house from you several months ago. Yes, ma'am. I remember. What can I do for you? Well, I'm not sure. May I sit down, please? Well, of course, of course. It's right here. Now. I thought perhaps you might... you might tell me something. Like what? About the house. Yes, ma'am. I know what you mean. I expected you a long time before this. It was built in 1801 by a man by the name of Silas Clausen. He left it to his son, Michael. Michael was a sea captain, and a good one, so they say. But he was mean. Mean. Killed a lot of his men. Finally, a crew mutinied, and they keel-hauled him. What does that mean? Drug him back and forth across the bottom of his boat. Barnacles chewed him up pretty bad, I guess. Near tore off his right leg. After that, he was different. When the mutineers was all hung, he retired from the sea. Was he married? He was. What was her name? Elspeth. And what... what happened to her? Don't you know, Mrs. Courtney? out hunting. Andy? Well, you're kidding. He's never hunted in his life. Never before now. That was a pretty mysterious telegram, Ellen. Why didn't you call me up? Andy had the phone taken out. Why? Ever since we moved into this house, Andy's been different. How? He's changed into another person, a person I've never seen before. And neither of you. Bill, you wouldn't recognize him. He gets into moods. He hardly even talks to me, and when he does, I don't know who he is. Well, he's, uh, he's, he's never had any time to himself before. Well, this is a pretty tough adjustment to make, Ellen. Look. 
He sits at this board all day long and draws things. It looks like part of an old sailing vessel. There's something else I'd like you to see. Andy. How are you? Ellen told me you were out slaughtering the local wildlife. I, I couldn't believe it. Well, there, uh, there are no letters. I, I tried to call you. I had a feeling you were trying to keep something from me. You don't like me to keep things from you, do you? Well, it all depends. You came here for a reason? Get to the point. All right. I'm kind of swamped at the office, and I thought maybe you might want to help. Help yourself, Gideon. You always have. Gideon. Andy, I came here because Ellen wired me. She was worried about you. Why don't you say what you mean, Gideon? Why do you keep calling me that? Why don't you drop this pose? Admit you came here for Elspeth. I'm afraid you're going to have to make yourself clear. Gladly. I accuse you of consorting with Elspeth, my wife. Consorting? You have betrayed me. You lied to me enough. Now get out of here. Andy. Get out. Go on, get out. Get out. Oh, Bill. <laughs> I should have killed you both. Andy, you're sick. Yes, I'm sick of your deceits and your lies. Sick of them all, Elspeth. I'm not Elspeth. I'm not Elspeth. God. Old Mr. Leach, the real estate agent, would tell you that Andrew Courtney was possessed or taken over by the dead sea captain whose tormented presence or ghost lived on in the ancient house. Once the house was destroyed, the captain was destroyed, and Andrew was restored to himself. It's not an entirely satisfactory explanation, is it? But it's the best we can do right now. In a moment, a word about next week. It was just an ordinary boarding house mirror, but when Paul Marlin looked into it, he got a shattering glimpse into the future. He took a horrifying step beyond our known world. Perhaps it's just as well that most of us cannot see into the future. You can decide for yourself next week.
story you're about to see true? Well, no one really knows. No one as yet has been able to prove or disprove it. And so it remains in limbo, a part of that vast, uncharted world of psychic phenomena beyond our powers of explanation. Laughter is an international language, and the clown, the prince of laughter. He is a universal phenomenon. He's as old as man's culture. He always has been and always will be with us. He's the heart and the essence of the circus, or the festival, the carnival. Always the very center of noisy, happy crowds. It's the same everywhere. China, Russia, Germany, Italy, America. But where does the gaiety disappear to when the festival is over? The circus ended, the carnival closed for the night. What happens to the droll man in the ridiculous costume? The carnival grounds are empty now. And the shrill piping voice of the calliope, still. The performers in their trailers are speaking in hushed tones because something happened here tonight, something that was so bizarre that even the normally superstitious carny folk found it almost impossible to believe. Just a few hours ago, the first shadow fell. A psychic shadow. Here, Carnival! Where are you going? You said we could have some fun. I said if you behaved yourself. Well, didn't I? Come on. Look, a clown! <laughs> Look, a clown. A putty nose and a grease paint smile. The man inside the clown? Anonymous. X. But that doesn't matter because usually the only function of the clown is to make us laugh. Usually. Double rye. Now let me see. What am I going to have? Well, you ain't going to have anything, little girl, till I see some sort of identification. <laughs> I'm a married woman. Well, I'm his wife. Look. And of age. Well, sorry, but that's the rule. Don't you worry. We all make mistakes. Anyways, I just want a, a pop. Sure. You know, you had me there for a minute. I thought he was your, uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> What's so funny? What's so funny? And who asked you? Come on over and sit down. I'll bring you your pop. Available. 
Tanya, I didn't do anything, not a thing. Oh, no. Not you, not a thing. Look at you. Look at you. I'm telling you, Nani, one of these days you're going to drive me too far, do you understand? I am so sick of watching you put on that nice, sweet act. Listen to me. I'm listening, I'm listening. Can I have a candy bar? There you go again. Every man, every one of them. What's the matter with you? Why do you act like that? Walk like you do. Be like that. Like what? Like you are. Well, how else can I be except like I am? You're cheap. You're cheap. Insult 1,275. I know it the first time I saw you, too. Remember out there on the road? Your old man's fruit stand, you selling peaches. <laughs> peaches. I said to myself, she's fresh as a peach herself. But look out. Wrong. Wrong. And still I fell for it, didn't I? I had to have you. Sorry. <clears throat> Can I have that candy bar? You don't listen, do you? I talk, but you don't listen. I'm listening, Tom. I'm listening. You want to fudge here or something? All I want is, is that you act decent, Tim Stan. Can't you see what it's doing to me? <laughs> you're getting gray there, and there. Stop it! There. That's why you're so mean. at all, huh? Oh, gee, I'm sorry. What do they call that, a mute? But listen, it's not as bad as all that. And you've got a smile that makes up for a thousand words. A million, in fact. Pretty soft hair. I like it too. I sure do. I guess maybe I oughtn't to say that. But it's real nice. Like silk. You go ahead. Feed it all you like. Didn't I tell you it's smooth and silk? Sweet to have someone like you around. Someone who never says anything mean and nasty. You're real sweet. <laughs> I like you. I should do. You like anything. I can't leave you alone. Oh. I can't trust you for a minute anymore. After the talking, I double ride. Just a nice guy. A nice guy. Oh, wow. just a sweet clown. Just as long as I'm like my hair. It's soft. You like it. It's soft. Will you leave me alone? Will you get out of here and leave my wife's hair alone? He's just sweet. Yeah, he's just sweet like all the others. He likes my hair. He's real me. sweet. He's a nice clown. He likes your hair. It's lovely hair, isn't it? Nice. It really is lovely hair. Nice. There. You like her hair? Well, here. Have <laughs> Feel it all you want. 
You dirty sheep. I've had it from you. I've had it, do you hear? Oh, the boss is looking for you. Better get out here with your balloons. Help! Help! Somebody help! The clown's killed a dame! What are you talking about? I'm not kidding. He's just sitting there crying like a baby. She's bleeding. Nobody opens that door till the police get here. But Buck said he saw the Buck whole thing. Buck was shooting is... off his mouth. Yeah, but I caught him red-handed, I tell you. I saw him with my own eyes. I don't care what you saw. Pippo couldn't do a thing like that. Anybody knows Pippo wouldn't hurt a fly. He's big, he's dumb maybe, but... But he... I saw him. He could talk for himself. When the police get here, he can write down what happened. Oh, that poor innocent girl. Stabbed with them wicked scissors of his. I always knew there was something wrong with that Pippo. You mind your own business. All right, back to work. Let's break it up. Come on. Look at that dummy. Look at his face. Grinning. Just grinning. As if it was some big joke.
soaking wet. Look, the clown. Pippo, the clown. Yes, usually his only function is to make us laugh. It is certainly not to disturb the secure curtain of reality, which hides from our eyes what. And if it makes you more comfortable to consider all that has happened merely an illusion, well then, by all means, you be comfortable. But the definition of illusion is that which is unreal. Now, the clown was soaking wet, wasn't he? And that's reality. And the clown never left this trailer. And that's reality. And the prison cell in which Tom Reagan will spend so many years, that is most certainly reality. But, as I said, be comfortable. In a moment, something about next week. Next week, and every week, we'll be bringing you the personal records of the rarest kind of human experience. Man's adventure in the world of the unknown. That mysterious psychic world beyond our five senses. This is your invitation to take with us that astonishing one step beyond.